Hey, gang, this week's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Hey, buying tickets to your favorite events shouldn't be stressful. With killer deals on last minute tickets and their best price guarantee, you can snag the tickets without the stress with Game Time. Download the Game Time app now, create an account, and use code GOODSEATS for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem the code Good Seats for 20 bucks off. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Download Game Time today. And now, here's our show. The trailer outside the Cincinnati Gardens was a telltale sign that something was going on today. The building is sold and the new owners decided it was moving day for the Legends Museum the biggest collection of gardens memorabilia. Everything in the Legends Museum, uh, originally we had plans that, that we'd hope to auction it off from the museum itself inside the building, but unfortunately uh, the, the timing of things weren't going to work out the, the way that the new owners were looking to, to move forward with it, so unfortunately it had to be dismantled this week. Dismantled and hauled to everything but the house's warehouse in Linwood. Last load with those turnstiles, Royals team photos, and a Cincinnati Mohawks hockey goal rolled in this afternoon. Inside, they were cataloging and admiring the old banners, warm-ups, trophies, and roller derby posters that are the hard copies of four generations of memories. I would say there's going to be about five to 600 items in this auction, and there will be items in the future that aren't available to be released right now. The auction will be online late next month or early September. All of this stuff will be up for bid in that everything but the house online auction. A lot of people are asking about the seats in the Cincinnati Gardens. Well, they're still bolted down and belong to the new owners, the Cincinnati Port Authority, and they haven't decided yet what they're going to do with them. The Port Authority's website says the iconic concrete reliefs of the boxer, hockey player, and basketball player will be saved and likely turned over to a nonprofit for preservation. The rest, including a hockey stick autographed by Garth Brooks, is up for grabs. Everything on our website starts at a dollar and goes to the highest bidder, so everybody will have ample and equal opportunity to bid and win a piece of the uh, Cincinnati Gardens history before the old arena becomes history itself early next year. In Roselawn, Joe Webb, Local 12 News. Welcome to Good Seats Still Available, a curious little podcast devoted to exploring what used to be in professional sports. Here's your host, Tim Hanlon. Well now, how's it going everybody? Your pal Tim here. Tim Hanlon, that is, reporting for duty. It's good seats still available. You know it, you love it, you can't live without it. It's the podcast, the curious little podcast, not so little anymore, that's devoted to what used to be in professional sports. Thank you for coming on by and finding us in the mass thicket of podcast choices. We appreciate it. Uh, The clip sets the tone, and uh, we're going back to Cincinnati. We love Cincinnati, Cincinnati, Ohio. And uh, the clip from, let's see, July 2016, that was Joe Webb, then at WKRC-TV Local 12 News in Cincinnati, now since retired and teaching away in an adjunct fashion at that great Jesuit institution in downtown Cincinnati called Xavier University, a Sweet 16, Sweet 16, he says, team in the NCAA tournament this year. Congrats to them. And uh, we're talking about to the old Cincinnati Gardens, uh, as uh, alluded to, uh, back then when uh, the memorabilia from said legendary gardens was uh, sort of being put up for auction before its uh, uh, eventual demolition. Uh, And the vast memories in there, yeah, the Beatles, yeah, Elvis, yeah, basketball with Oscar Robertson Robertson and the Royals, uh, but a huge and very long-lasting hockey uh, history for sure in the gardens. And uh, this week's topic with our return guest, Eric Weltner, we're going to be talking about the uh, the hockey team that uh, an epic uh, run for a team known as the Cincinnati Mohawks. And you heard in that little clip there, uh, perhaps some of the most uh, sought after memorabilia when the uh, gardens uh, came to its demise. And rightly so, because the Cincinnati Mohawks And we're talking about the second version of them, of the International Hockey League. There was a three-year Mohawks franchise that existed in the American Hockey League from 1949 
1952. But in 1952, uh, that uh, previous Mohawks team left and in came a brand new franchise in the International Hockey League known as the Mohawks that lasted for six seasons and as an affiliate of the Montreal Canadiens, they won six consecutive, those the only six years they were there, six consecutive International Hockey League titles. Uh, and in the playoffs, they won five of the six championships that were available to them in the IHL. A phenomenal record, these Cincinnati Mohawks. And as we'll talk about our conversation with Eric in just a few moments, uh, it was a monopoly of sorts. And that's also the, the name of the film that Eric has just put out called Mohawk Monopoly, 1952 to 1958. And uh, the saga, the story of this, uh, there's no better word to say, to describe it, dominant franchise in International Hockey League history, the Cincinnati Mohawks of the IHL. And uh, the Cincinnati uh, Mohawks, definitely part of the fabric and the history of the Canadiens franchise, for sure, uh, as we get into uh, our conversation. You may remember, Eric, uh, from our uh, episode number 181, which you should bookmark uh, and or go back and and find. Uh, we talked about uh, the Columbus uh, version of the IHL, uh, the Columbus team known as the, um, well, it was actually uh, the Checkers and the Golden Seals uh, and the Owls. And uh, his movie from uh, that conversation called International Incidents. Uh, so talk about uh, Columbus's hockey heritage. But this this is quite a different story. This was the uh, phenomenon that was the Mohawks in Cincinnati. Uh, and uh, again, f- six straight titles th- and then and then disappearing. Uh, and five Turner Cups, the, uh, the title uh, trophy in the IHL. Uh, there's been no team in that period of time uh, that could uh, uh, even come close to that kind of dominance. Uh, and and uh, we're going to get into some of the uh, unique uh, uh, stories around why this was such a dominant team, Uh, the role of Montreal, the stocking of the team, uh, how Cincinnati took to these Mohawks and uh, remembered them so, so, uh, so deeply. Uh, It was voted the International Hockey League's greatest team when they were celebrating that league's uh, 50th anniversary back in 1995. And for good reason, it's our conversation with Eric Weltner. We talk about the Cincinnati Mohawk monopoly in hockey, talking about all good, good stuff about that uh, in just a few moments' time. Please stay tuned. You will enjoy it, I guarantee. And uh, let's remind you that um, not only can you find the Mohawk Monopoly movie, uh, just go to vimeo.com slash on demand slash Mohawk Monopoly, and you'll have the opportunity to see this great film as we've had uh, for yourself. It's fantastic. Great images, some great uh, footage in there. And uh, just uh, hearkening back to a time when uh, minor league hockey and the dominance of such was just such a, a cool thing. And the Cincinnati Gardens, which themselves were uh, quite something. Uh, and let's commemorate that, shall we, with our sponsor this week, OldSchoolShirts.com. Uh, our pal, P.F. Wilson and his team there in Cincinnati, of all places. OldSchoolShirts.com. You know about them. You've heard about them forever on this show. Uh, literally every kind of team and league that you might remember from the past or maybe just plain forgot are can be found there. And you can just neatly search up, just go in the sports section, pick the sport that you're interested in, and, and voila, you'll be transported to all those great memories. If you can't remember the sport or the league, how about just go into the city section? And uh, that's what we did by going to Cincinnati. And the Cincinnati section is replete with a lot of uh, fantastic uh, commemorative shirts uh, from Cincinnati's hockey past, including uh, the Mohawks. Uh, there's a white shirt there. There's a red shirt in there. There's a gray shirt with the old sort of uh, Indian logo. There also uh, there's a hockey the club logo in there. Uh, there's a stadium arena cup there, and there's also some other uh, memories of Cincinnati uh, hockey teams of the past as well. Do you remember the Rail Raiders? Uh, perhaps the uh, Lumberjacks. Uh, maybe you remember the Mighty Ducks. Uh, how about the Cincinnati Swords? Uh, all kinds of memories there, both in shirt and cup form. 
for you there amongst many, many of the items at OldSchoolShirts.com. Promo code for you there, of course, uh, for 10% off all of your purchases. Write this down and use it early and often is Good Seats. 10% off all of your purchases at OldSchoolShirts.com when you use the promo code Good Seats, not just for Cincinnati Mohawks shirts and cups, but all kinds of great sports memories and even pop culture memories uh, when you go there early and often. Again, thank you to our pal P.F. Wilson and his team at OldSchoolShirts.com. Uh, we appreciate your support of this here little show and uh, hopefully a few new uh, purchases of Cincinnati Mohawks garb uh, coming your way. And uh, we appreciate you checking them out for sure and using that promo code for sure. And we also appreciate you listening uh, right now to our great conversation with Eric Weltner, our return guest. Let's talk about Cincinnati Mohawks International Hockey League hockey and the, just the sheer dominance of this franchise. A great and interesting conversation. I learned a lot. Hopefully you will too. Here it is. Please, as always, enjoy. We welcome back to our microphones, uh, uh, you, Eric. We appreciate your, your making time. And I think when we last uh, chatted, um, we were kind of going down the rabbit hole of uh, Columbus in particular and uh, the International Hockey League uh, and the various iterations uh, of such and um, uh, Columbus Chill and, and um, well, it, it, there's a whole sort of bunch of stuff there. Uh, but so give us a uh, remind us of your background um, and uh, and the hockey intrigue that you you bring to not only this story, but uh, it, it's clear that you've got something going for minor league hockey, the state of Ohio, et cetera. Yes. Well, I grew up in a suburb of Columbus, Ohio, and I played hockey as a youth and I attended games there in the minor leagues, which, as you touched upon, my team was primarily the Columbus Owls. And then I also would attend uh, Ohio State Buckeye games and just always enjoyed the sport. And my motivation for doing the Columbus film was it, it all of a sudden grew into this NHL city but all this really fun, great old time hockey was forgotten. So I wanted to make sure that that was preserved before time got away from all of us and too much sand went through the hourglass and uh, celebrate that and also share it with the, with the players and their family so they can somewhat relive that era. And then I spent a number of years in Cincinnati, Ohio and as I delved more into hockey history and um, just the local community, I started to be intrigued by the Cincinnati Mohawks who played in Cincinnati in the 1950s. And they had parallel success with their parent club, the Montreal Canadiens, who built their dynasty in the 1950s and uh, put the grab on six Stanley Cups out of 10 years. So, um, that was that was the intrigue. It, the Mohawks emerged to be the most decorated and dominant team in the history of the International Hockey League. Well, so so let's let's dig in there because um, I, you know I, I I I'm a passing hockey fan and 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 arguably perhaps just of sort of a maybe more modern version of the NHL. But the more we get exposed to um, the various minor leagues today, but also in the past. Uh, so many interesting sort of stories reveal themselves. And, and this one, uh, completely unknown to to me, um, was, I mean, you're, you're, I think you're almost underselling it. I mean, th this team, why don't you set the, set the stage? This is a team that uh, existed for a most, but not all, of the 1950s uh, in Cincinnati. And, and Cincinnati at the time, the 1950s, not necessarily the top of mind, for professional sports, uh, baseball is sure, but even the Bengals hadn't arrived at by at this point yet. And then they had not, and and various other forms of pro sports were, dare I say, mostly of the minor league variety, if at all. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The the Royals in the NBA did come with the big O, Oscar Robertson, oh. in the latter part of the nineteen fifties. Sure, but not for a whole long, not not for a huge long period of time. I mean, no, it, it, yeah, right. But in the yeah, hockey so, front, though, right? 
Yeah, not on the hockey front. And what you said uh, about 30 seconds ago was pretty much my impetus for it. In fact, a gentleman here in Cincinnati who has written for film and television for a number of decades had a great article that he wrote about the movie. And the, the title pretty much summarized it saying it was something to the effect of Cincinnati Mohawks, the best team nobody has ever heard of. And that was really the reason I wanted to do this because a handful of players are still living and this team was off the charts good. And basically they were somewhat, I guess, forgotten for lack of a better term. Okay. Well, we'll get into why, but why don't you set the, set the stage here because um, the Mohawks uh, uh uh, arrived in 19 well the 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 version we're going to be talking about the 1952 um but but th- there was also a why don't you sort of set the tone as to uh, the original mohawks the, the american hockey league version thereof because obviously mm-hmm. that kind of in some respects sets the stage for what then became the this dominant team that you spend most of the time in the in the movie talking about right uh good point so the Original American Hockey League Mohawks showed up in 1949. And interestingly enough, they just took the the ice as Cincinnati. They didn't even have an official name yet. And then sort of towards the end of October, <laughs> someone just proclaimed them that they're the Mohawks. So they went with that and stayed with it. Uh, but they had middling success in the American League, primarily because they were a dual affiliate for a couple of years with the Rangers and the Canadians. And they, the management, the Cincinnati local management, thought that they were getting their roster rated way too often and that that was precluding them from having any success in the American League. And I guess also somewhat geographically, they were losing money. So between not being competitive, losing their players, and losing money, they decided to opt out of the American League in 1952 and then were invited into the International Hockey League to take the ice in the fall of that year. And um, with that, the International Hockey League dynasty was born. Before we go further, fundamentally, of what you know, and I'm ignorant of this, what what, what fundamentally is different between the AHL and the IHL at this period of time? Like, why is this possibly perceived as a greener pasture, per se? Well, the the better, like truly developmental next step to the show league would have been the American Hockey League. And that still is the case today. And so these guys were mostly coming straight out of junior. So there was not a lot of veteran presence uh, on the International Hockey League team at all until they got a few years down the road where some of the guys just stayed. Because one of the other things that management wanted was when they entered into the international league, they wanted player control. So they were, they were an affiliate with Montreal and that's why they were so replete with talent, but they controlled the actual playing contract each year was with the Cincinnati garden who owned the club. So they controlled the players as far as who could get called up and who did not. So it wasn't a parent club making the call. They would have to agree to it which allowed them to really amass some consistent talent and keep lines together and keep good goaltenders and good defensemen and um, just make a, a prolific offense as well. Well, in this shift, though, um, was it because of this shift or uh, despite it uh, to the uh, to the International uh, League that um, – the affiliations, plural, of the previous team went to only one team, this yes. Montreal Canadiens franchise. And and what maybe a little bit of back, why is that? Or why was that, perhaps? Yeah, it was interesting because they they just didn't want to continue to lose players and money. So they uh, jumped into the International League where it was also more geographically friendly, where it's more of a, 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 as they say, a bus league and and way less travel to the East coast and new England and all that. Um, So that, that was the, their primary reason to, to do that. And the the guys made less money. So 
that was another impetus, I think. But the um, the dual affiliation, I, I it was just something that was not attractive to them. And if you recall or, or know anything about the NHL, it was it was a boys' club. There was there was nothing but collusion. Well, it's the, always there's uh, always six the, teams in, then, right? Yeah, Before. there were only six teams, and then and, and there were you know four or five guys who who ran the whole darn thing. So they uh, they were not real interested in 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 giving anybody a break or sharing any money or any power so um you know it was sort of a more of a wild wild west type of environment back in the 1950s where these other multiple minor leagues existed well how does montreal in particular wind up quote-unquote getting or or receiving or uh, muscling in to solely control this franchise um that's a very good question. The one thing that they had was all the talent. So back in that era, you had regional uh, preference. So almost every guy who came up through Quebec or Northern Ontario, their playing rights were directly pretty much awarded to Montreal. And so they just happened to have a glut of talent back then. And, you know, they assembled teams with guys like uh, Rocket Richard and Jean Beliveau and Boom Boom Jeffreyon and Doug Harvey, Elmer Locke, guys like that. And so they had a, like, an abundance of talent, and they also had their, their other higher affiliate leagues to, I guess, bring their, their guys into a more developmental environment and then they needed to put their really young greenhorn guys somewhere so they had a familiarity with cincinnati because the other thing that's crazy about this story is and the fact that the the ahl team didn't have much success is you had um king clancy was the coach and he's in the hall of fame the guy who was the general manager at the time was frank selke in the hall of fame and you had players coming through, like Emil the Cat Francis, who ended and ended up being in the Hall of Fame. I think is more of an executive. And then you had Buddy O'Connor, who played um, with the team, and he also ended up in the Hall of Fame as a player. So I mean, the talent was there, and the and the brain trust was there. So the fact that they struggled, I think, was more attributable to the the loss of players. So with that context, when Cincinnati accepted a bid into the International Hockey League. Frank Selke had been had become familiar with the market. And so he said, Hey, we have all these extra guys and you know, these nineteen and twenty year old guys, we need a place for them to play. How about we supply you with the the players and you can have and you can have a team. And so their cast offs were better than most everybody's uh top top line players. So what was Montreal's approach to this, right? It seems like the their, this IHL franchise was kind of, I don't know, what, was it the closest stepping stone to getting the final call up to the to the big show? Or because, um, I mean, the quality of the, or, or was it sort of a mix of rookie or raw talent as you're hinting at? It was, um, it was a lot of rookie and raw talent and you still needed to go more through an American league um, squad or a, a Quebec league to really probably get the next the next step to up up to the NHL. So these were pretty young guys that they were trying to uh, hone into into better better players. But th- their sheer talent was incredibly uh, impressive and so much greater than the rest of the league for the extended period of time of six years. It was. It was not even fair most of the time. All right. Well, let's set that background up for those who are uh, unaware, because we're talking about this team and it's in this uh, IHL incarnation um, mm-hmm. uh, being reconstituted or, or, or being rebranded, if you will, and relaunched, if you will, in 1952. And all the way through 1958, that's what, six seasons. Yes. Tell, tell us, <laughs> Tell us what they achieved in – six regular seasons and in six playoff runs. Right. So they played those six seasons. And in those six seasons, they won six league championships and they won five straight Turner cup playoff 
championships. And then they also played a tournament in the spring of 1953, which pitted um, different league champions against each other for the right to be proclaimed the uh, United States champion. And they won that. So they, when they set out to play for a title, there were 13 of those. And in their history, they won 12. They lost one series of hockey in their entire six year run. And we're talking about a league that was largely six teams. Uh, there was a year, I think there were two, there were, there were, there were maybe twice that many, mm-hmm. but plus you're also mentioning inter interleague matchups. Um, but so uh, I, I guess the question is why were they so dominant? Was it because Montreal had taken this approach of concentrating this talent and and sort of keeping them steady there, i.e., not moving and you know dipping into the well too much too often as 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 be beset the the previous franchise, or was it because the Canadiens organization was just so darn good at finding raw talent, and it didn't matter who they put on the ice? Right, that there's a combination of all that. It's that Montreal just had the players. It was somewhat by happenstance that. Just in that era of uh, young men coming up through Quebec and Northern Ontario, they just had great players. So I had the the uh, pleasure and privilege to interview Scotty Bowman for this movie, and he was a, a very kind and helpful participant. But then you know you talk to him, and he's like, "Oh yeah, Donnie Marshall. He grew up two blocks behind me. So like you have you have the greatest coach in the history of the league with." Uh, Who's a who's a who's a friend and and uh, neighborhood mate and teammate with a future five time Stanley Cup champion and and all star? They just had this concentration of talent. So part of it was just I think dumb luck, and that because that region was what was uh, putting out the the talent. But then also they did send them to Cincinnati and. Uh, fair amount of the guys stayed as um, as regulars for a few years, like Billy Gould and Reggie Gregg and Bon Smith. And so I think their familiarity with one another in a, in a playing system just kept them um, at the top of the heap because they also had their, their talent scout and, uh, and GM was uh, Kenny Reardon, who was a Hall of Fame defenseman himself with the Canadians. So – the uh, the talent was there not just on the ice; it was also there in the executive offices. Um, how many other do you know offhand? How many other minor league teams Montreal had at the time to sort of similarly, uh, you know, spread out this talent? Yeah, they had uh, uh, they had a presence in the Quebec League, uh, the Buffalo Bisons, and then uh, I think it was in the Quebec League, and then they did have an AHL presence as well. And were any of those other teams as dominant and or regular, you know, uh, winning as as the Mohawks were? No, that's the funny thing is they were OK. Um, I think one team did win their league. And then uh, but the the dominance was sort of at the top and then at their at the bottom because Montreal won six Stanley Cups in that 1950s decade and I think lost a couple finals themselves and then it was the Mohawks and then their other affiliates were just um you know above average but um not nearly as dominant nor as successful as the parent club all right well before we go there I want to actually let's talk about the the arena for a second and I'm, uh, this is a and I'm not from Cincinnati uh but mm-hmm. here it, here's a little nit that I noticed and I, I can't figure out the answer to uh, mm-hmm. despite my investigation you see some of the early uh you know mentions and um, and photos and and memorabilia and stuff saying Cincinnati Garden singular mm-hmm. and then in later yes. years and obviously by the time it died it was uh known as a plural there were multiple gardens it seemed the Cincinnati Gardens um do you have any insight as to what the difference is between the singular and the plural in this like was there a name change or was there something dramatic that happened that made it put an s on the end of it or or was it just sort of a I don't know. Did it just sort of evolve and nobody sort of seemed to notice? That is, that was a mystery that I did not solve. Um, I, cause I said the same thing to a few people because 
it was referred to as the Cincinnati Garden when it opened in 1949. And it was for a, a bunch of years. And then when I moved here, it was the Cincinnati Gardens. And I could never find any substantiation as to why it was actually called singular garden and then changed to gardens later. Um, there was even some um, contradiction in a couple of the programs where the facility was called the Cincinnati Garden, but the ownership was called Cincinnati Gardens Incorporated. So it was just uh, it was just a mishmash of um, linguistics that that didn't uh, didn't really make any sense. All right. Well, but the physical we're... building was also called the Garden at the time. So I, I, when we were making the film, that was one of the things that I thought some of the locals might um, ask the same question. Be like, well, it's called the gardens, but all the publications and the news articles and the uh, doc, legal documents and things indicated it was called the Cincinnati Garden. So, well, we'll, we'll have to put that out there to to our listening audience because if there's anybody who is a fan of the Silverbacks of the old NPSL indoor soccer league or the Cincinnati Royals or, or uh, you know, or the, the, the numerous uh, minor league hockey teams like the Swords and the the Mighty Ducks and, and some of these others that sort of went through. I mean, there's a whole I mean, there's a whole host of events and programs and stuff that we got to dig through to find out maybe the answer. And But if anybody seems to know that answer, I'm, we're certainly happy to have it because it's it I'd remains, love to know that it remains a mystery to me. And and this is a guy who went deep on, the, on one of the one of the legendary teams of this building's existence and he didn't even know. So let's yeah. uh, let's put it out there. All right. So let me. So let, let's let's sort of roll it back. So as you were doing this film, um, how did you? What was your source material? And uh, you're mentioning a number of the players were still around. Um, mm -hmm. How many would you say? And 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 uh, how forthcoming and or um, detailed were their memories? Uh, a few were really, really sharp. I, I think I got in touch with about 11 or 12. Um, so Billy Gould, who was a captain, and he was actually the the coach, a player coach of the team, its final season. And he was also an IHL All-Star. He actually uh, settled in Cincinnati and still lives here. So... Um, he was a great resource. He was the first one I tracked down, I think, and then uh, found another International Hockey League legend up in Toledo, Glenn Ramsey, who was one of the goaltenders for the final two seasons here. And then he played he played the second most games in the history of the International Hockey League. And uh, he was he was very informative and had a lot of good material. And then uh, I had the pleasure of talking with Phil Goyette and Donnie Marshall, um, former NHL coach and uh, Avco Cup winner uh, in the World Hockey Association. World Hockey Association. Uh, Tom McVie. He his context was being a rival player when he played against the team when he was with the Toledo Mercury. So I liked those other rival perspectives that he were, he was able to offer in a Mr. Comet, Eddie Long, who played for about 15 years or so in Fort Wayne. So I found a handful of guys. We had a, had a little bit of uh, film to work with. And then a number of people did have personal photo collections from their time there and scrapbooks and things of that nature. So that's what we used along with uh, about 13 minutes of, of, game film and some motion graphics and some sound design and some narration and put it all together to make soup. No, no radio broadcasts that you could uh, discern or find. No, that that's been uh, really disappointing in the past two projects I've done is how much stuff has just been jettisoned and which also really makes it imperative to keep preserving this history because back in that era when you shot film maybe even for a television station it was shot on film and then the it was processed and, and the, uh, put in a canister and, and warehoused so eventually you run out of warehouse space so a lot of things were just jettisoned we searched high and low for 
for source material through the history museum and library systems and universities and things and there was nothing doing so it's uh pretty disappointing well what uh what players stood out to you either going into this project or revealed themselves as you either talked to them or learn more about this eight-year run of this franchise say that again please uh, the players uh, and coaches uh, what, what names kind of stood out to you either going into this project or perhaps revealed themselves to you as you did your research and or uh, interviews. Right. Well, the, the big time players who emerged were Don Marshall, Phil Goyette and Charlie Hodge, I would say that played on those teams and they really had fantastic NHL careers and won multiple Stanley cups and played in all-star games. Bill Sutherland was another one who had a really nice NHL career. And then guys like Lou Marcone, he, he made it to the national hockey league for a little bit, but the ones that were the, the linchpins at the international hockey league level were Billy Gould, Reggie Gregg, Bun Smith, um, and Sutherland played a few years here, about, about three. And then another guy scoring Warren Hines, who was a prolific scorer and Max McLock, and then you had some really fantastic goaltenders come through here of that nature. I already mentioned Glenn Ramsey and Charlie Hodge. And then they, you also had uh, uh, Claude Evans and uh, name is escaping me right now. Um, Jock Marcotte. Jock Marcotte came through as well. So um, there was just some impressive play. It was interesting to see that they could take this core of players who were pretty much just going to be international hockey league level players and then place new guys annually into the lineup to create this juggernaut, just sort of like parts or parts and, and they would find a way to, to work. And then obviously Roly McClanahan, who was the player coach for four years, he was just fantastic. He was a dominant defenseman and set a few league records for offensive production and scored the fastest three goals in under a minute um, and was an all-star player and an all-star coach. He was truly, truly dominant. And he served as a mentor on the ice and obviously as the bench boss for the Mohawks, but he certainly led by example and got it done on his own too. All right, what's this? Game time? Fantastic. Hey, buying tickets to your favorite events shouldn't be stressful. With killer deals on last-minute tickets and their best price guarantee, you can snag the tickets without the stress with the Game Time app. And I will tell you, the Game Time app has gotten me out of a couple of jams on more than a few occasions. I'll tell you, a couple of weeks back, I travel fairly often for work. I was stuck in New York. I had uh, dinner plans fall through uh, during a business trip. I was leaving the next morning, uh, but had some time on my hands. And what's a sports guy like me to do? Well, scouring around to see if there are any events going on. And sure enough, the Knicks were playing the Nets at home at the world's most famous arena. So about an hour before the game, I fired up the Game Time app and uh, found a decently priced ticket. I won't tell you what <laughs> the people around me paid for their ticket, but it was, certainly wasn't nearly as expensive as theirs. And I got to watch the Knicks uh, uh, in a rare uh, moment of uh, uh, amazingness, uh, kick the snot out of the nets. Uh, but that's uh, game time is uh, the place uh, to get your last minute tickets. Uh, they've got a tremendous set of deals, flash deals, they call them, uh, and last minute tickets. Uh, they're easy to find and buy uh, for just about every kind of event you want, sports and entertainment and music, that kind of stuff. The images, the seat views are just perfect. They're great. That's that's always like the, the big uh, conundrum when you're looking at a, uh, a seating chart. You have no idea where you're going to be, uh, what your view is going to be like. And Game Time's got uh, probably the best imagery that I've seen of any of the uh, ticket sites out there. And, of course, they've got a lowest price guarantee, including event cancellation protection. So you know you're going to be covered in case. As a matter of fact, that the Game Time guarantee means that you'll always get the best price. And if you find tickets in the same section 
uh, and row for less, Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference. Uh, don't believe me? Try it for yourself. Download the Game Time app now, create an account, and then on us, use the code GOODSEATS for $20 off of your first purchase. Again, that's the Game Time app. And uh, it's also, uh, you can check them also out at gametime.co. Uh, but get the app, download the app now, create an account, and use the code GOODSEATS for 20 bucks off your first purchase. Terms apply for sure. Last minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. It's game time. Thank you, game time, for your sponsorship of this week's episode. And now, back to our conversation. Tell me about the the rivalries, uh, two of these teams uh, that they're playing. I mean, it was largely, the exception, I think, of one year, a six-team circuit. And and also, too, in, in the midst, midst of all that, can you describe both for this team and the teams in this league how frequent or infrequent uh, the turnover was, the, the call-ups, so to speak? It sounds like, at least in Montreal's case with Cincinnati, there was a bit more... I don't know of a nod towards uh, keeping things stable, um, mm-hmm. but but I was that happening with the other teams in the league, and and did that add or take away from some of these these rivalries? I mean, you you call out a few and sh- and even talk about some some interesting, uh, uh, shall we say, uh, tete a tetes in certain yes. matches. Yeah, um, the Toledo and Cincinnati situation was great. There was some acrimony on the ice, but then also very much a a war of words that flew between the management of each club. And Toledo had multiple times accused Cincinnati of overpaying their players and using players that were above the whatever league skill level. They thought that it was, it was almost sort of like a playground. Hey, you're too good. This isn't fair. These are um, the uh, Toledo Mercuries for those. Uh, the school Toledo players. Mercuries, yes. And then uh, the Grand Rapids Rockets uh, got together with their two main newspapers there in the city and were calling for the Mohawks to be banished from the league because they literally literally used these words, too good for us, because <laughs> it was not unusual, which was something I found very interesting in doing all of this research, it was not unusual for the Mohawks to hang double digits on teams. They'd win 11 to two, 12 to one. They beat one team, 17 to six, beat the same team another time, 16 to zero. It was, uh, it was sort of un- unfair and imbalanced. And in fact, even the, the uh, executive VP of the, I believe it's the executive VP. He was one of the top executives of the Cincinnati garden ownership group he just got tired of the accusations and basically turned the tables and said hey you know we're good we're filling your barn but you guys aren't good and we can't even ask people to come pay for a ticket to see this this uh overmatched situation where you guys might lose by 10 and yeah they also though it's a team that becomes the team everybody hates to play or or wants to play and is almost like the I don't know the evil empire or the the hated you know always winning kind of team and and maybe actually draws more attention when they come to visit. Yeah, they did. Yeah, that, that was the the thing was if you uh like wrestling or roller derby or whatever, they were the heel, I guess, just through pure success because Everybody just wanted to beat them, but rarely could they. In fact, one year, the Mohawks in a 60-game schedule lost only nine games. So in another season, they won the league by 44 standings points. So there wasn't a lot of close <laughs> close games or, or real uh, league title battles at all as well, far as what it had to be amazing standings look like. Yeah, it must have been amazingly frustrating, right? And then, uh, but in the, in the playoffs was really not that challenging either. I mean, there were a couple of seasons uh, where they had a little bit of a challenge, Troy being one of them in 54-55. And then they actually mm-hmm. lost their their final 
um, uh, approach. I mean, they they were they won uh, the cups every every year except for fifty seven fifty eight where they lost to to Louisville, an unfancied, uh, relatively unfancied Louisville Rebels team. Um, yeah, uh, which was sort of a an ignominious uh, sort of way to bow out. Uh, it truly uh, was. What was it about that last season? I mean, they did. You know, they did win the regular season, 57-58, from wire to wire, um, Mm -hmm. and probably were heavily favored to win again. Do you have any insight as to why uh, this, shall we say, relatively less than Louisville team surprised them in the first round that year? Yes, it's. um, I talked with uh, Billy Gould about it, and then Brian McLeay, who played on that team, and a couple of things they went into that series really quite injured too with uh, several of their top players and scorers pretty banged up and injured and there wasn't a lot of replacement back then if a guy was injured sometimes you just ended up playing without a player it, <laughs> you didn't have a you didn't have bench and roster depth you just sort of had your 14 guys and that was that was who you played with so there was that, and then remember Billy and Brian both said that they were such a fast skating team that the Louisville team booked games in a, a different arena, I think. I don't know if it was a different arena or if it was the one that they always played in, but they, they made it sound like it was a different ice surface than their typical arena, and it was much smaller, and they were able to use that to their advantage to slow the Mohawks down. So they weren't able to use all their uh, flash and dash that they were so successful with. So that was pretty much it. They 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 slowed them down and they checked them and they stifled them offensively in a smaller rink. So did they know that this was essentially their last season and their last playoff run, or did that not sort of become known until after the season was over? That didn't really manifest itself until the season was over. I think that the garden management had made some allusions to the fact that things weren't great financially and that things could certainly get better. And so then when they did that, when they did lose that one series, the um, ownership group announced that they were going to take a one year hiatus and then they pretty much promised that hockey would be back. And then it just never came back. They just literally went away. Did did the arrival of the Royals in 57 and and, and the basketball front maybe have anything to do with it? Because the Royals started their first season in 57, 58, which overlapped the last season of the Mohawks. I'm wondering if there was, I don't know, maybe management's, uh, you know, uh, interest was kind of maybe, wandering towards the big league, so to speak, of the NBA. Yeah, I, I think that, and I think there was just a fair amount of competition for the, the dollars because you even go back that to that era, you still had really good college sports here with the University of Cincinnati Bearcats, basketball being outstanding, and Xavier Musketeers being really good. So there was a competition for the entertainment dollars, and then you bring – Oscar and the Royals in, and then that pool gets even, even deeper. So um, there was, there was some of that. I never really picked up that they were fancying themselves to become more of a major league operation. But uh, I do think that, that all the, all the competitive situations did lead to maybe some trickling away of consumer dollars. It's interesting, though, because, uh, you know, C- Cincinnati is a hockey market. I mean, it 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 did sort of ebb and flow. Right. But there there mm-hmm. were still, you know, obviously before this Mohawk uh, incarnation existed and uh, on a number of different fronts afterwards. I mean, uh, the CPHL had a franchise there. The AHL came back with the swords in the 70s. Mm-hmm. Uh, the cycle yeah, the swords when the swords won the Calder Cup. Yeah, and and so it, it it seems like even though it wasn't sort of always consistent, there the, every few years or so, it seems at least in in terms of the gardens' uh, existence, I'm sure there could have been some other facilities that I'm just not aware of. That minor league hockey kind of would always seem to come back somehow. 
So there had to be something to this market. I for some some reason that you know, and and I I don't know. I mean, especially with such a dominant team, you would think, right? Yes, it was. It is odd how it ended. It's it really just sort of almost like uh, to to use a music reference. It's almost like just the somebody lifted the needle from the from the record, and that was it. Just no no sing out nothing. It just just ended. Uh, but yeah, I think it's a it's a very sports centric market. People love sports, especially baseball and high school sports. And the the Bengals are doing well now. The Reds are not, but people have always loved the big red machine. Um, and high school sports are quite big. And I also think it was a, a large enough market where there was always that attraction to put a team in there in this you know pretty populated part of the state of Ohio and, you know, on the border of Kentucky and Indiana as well. So there were a lot of fans to draw from, but yeah, it's definitely ebbed and flowed and they had not at the, they didn't play at the garden, but they had the Cincinnati stingers and the world hockey association for a handful of years too. And, you know, when you think about that, you had guys like Mark Messier play here, Mike Liut, um, I think Mike Gardner played here. Um, Robbie Fatorik, Rick Dudley, Barry Melrose. So some pretty big names came through this market as far as the the hockey universe goes. And then we had two minor league teams at, for one at one point for several years here with the Cincinnati Cyclones in the International Hockey League and the uh, Cincinnati Mighty Duck, Mighty Ducks that were playing at the Garden in the American Hockey League. And Mike Babcock coached them of Red Wings fame. Well, I, I, you know, that's so that brings up sort of the larger question, I guess, is that um, obviously we know what happened with the Stingers near the end of the uh, the WHA, and and um, but it, I guess the question really, it's pretty interesting that um, whatever reason Cincinnati sort of never made the short list when it came to the NHL's. Uh, continued expansion over the decades. And and I think most people were kind of perplexed, maybe, uh, or maybe it was a compromise when Columbus got the call versus, say, Cleveland and Cincinnati, mm-hmm. uh, which had had a number of different dalliances with both, well, in Cleveland's case, both the NHL and the WHA and Cincinnati with the yeah. WHA. Um, I, I, it's just, it's curious to me that the NHL would try to create something out of whole cloth in Columbus versus trying to go to a Cincinnati or a Cleveland where at least there were other, uh, shall we say, pro, uh, uh, you know, sportsdom uh, mm-hmm. and fans uh, structure there that, and, and maybe even arenas. Um, I'm wondering why Cincinnati didn't uh, maybe um, kind of rise to the top in this. Yeah, that's a question a lot of people asked. I think uh, the story with, the Columbus thing was they just had a good community and private enterprise plan and they got an arena built. And I think that's been the challenge for a lot of cities, not just even Cincinnati, but you, everybody wants that nice brand new arena to play in. And I don't think Cincinnati was able to come up with that. And uh, Mr. McConnell there in uh, Columbus, he said, you guys get an arena and I will buy the team. And, they all made good on that, and I guess that was attractive enough to the NHL that they put them in there, put the team in there. But, yeah, I've, I've never understood why Cincinnati was so overlooked other than maybe facilities or um, just a lack of interest. Maybe they did some studies with the consumers and didn't find that there was a viable audience. Where does the legacy of – uh this mohawks team uh either rightly or by default live now if anywhere right is is it uh are there any banners uh say in the in, what is it the u.s bank arena now i forget what it's called it used to be yes it's called heritage bank center now yes there you are uh or yeah. or at montreal do they even acknowledge uh the team do they make any recollections of of that history and heritage or is it really not anywhere and maybe sadly or, or maybe luckily only through this film. Right. Um, 
Well, I can honestly say that I have never attended a Canadiens game, but I did contact the club for for research purposes and trying to track down some things. And I think my I think your answer was the answer I got. They didn't have anything <laughs> regarding regarding uh, Cincinnati Mohawks. So uh, there was that. And no, there is nothing that hangs or pays tribute to this squad at the Heritage Bank Center currently. We, in fact, this is kind of interesting. When the Cincinnati Garden was sold, and they they did eventually raise it, so that it, that great building is now just a, a plowed under field, which is a shame. But they auctioned every they auctioned everything off. So at our premier event over the weekend, a guy who had won a few things at the auction had two actual banners that hung in the rafters at the Cincinnati garden, two championship banners and the uh, United States national championship trophy and the, the league trophy, the league um, title trophy. He won those at auction. So that's sort of what happened to all of that stuff. And, and those so are where now? Pretty do unceremonious. We, do we know where those are, those pieces? Those, that guy. Yeah, he has them. He brought them to our event. Like literally, these are in people's personal collections. Holy mackerel! Well, yeah, is, and and the and the current cyclones don't look back either, do they? Not a ton. They were. I worked with them in the past few weeks, and they were kind enough to host the the players who came in for the event and uh, hook them up with tickets, and then set up a little autograph station for them, and and announced their presence there at the game, and so the the fans came around and got some autographs on their sweaters and their programs and things like that. So um, they, they did do some acknowledgement and uh, we're very grateful and thankful for that. So as far as if there's any like permanent presence within the arena, no, there is not. Well, that's, uh, that's, yeah, it's a shame. I mean, I would argue that that's, that's kind of a natural place, right? If not uh, for Montreal and, and you look at some of the, um, the memorabilia there on eBay and online and stuff and look at some of the sweaters uh, that mm-hmm. the team had and stuff. And certainly the sort of very retro uh, logos and that kind of stuff. I, I um, just seems like I, we've seen this forever, right? There, there's all kinds of nostalgia and nostalgia sells and, there's, and your, your, your movie only kind of probably kickstarts people's interest. I'm sure there's a whole generation or two of people who don't even know that there was hockey before, you know, the current cyclones now or, 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 you know, that there was a, there is a rich and championship right. winning, you know, heritage in, in, in Cincinnati. Yeah. Well, to your point, I was talking to somebody here in recent days and someone literally asked me again, if Cincinnati still had a hockey team. And I, I can't believe that they, that they don't know. So that's sort of what you're dealing with. So if the, the current team is not even known about the, uh, imagine a team that lived here 70 years ago. Well, but still, I mean, minor league hockey is, is a, is a pretty robust. Uh, I mean, I, you know, I, I think a lot of people understand minor league baseball uh, and obviously it, that's mm-hmm. changed over the last two years with major league baseball kind of, you know, cornering in and, and sort of uh, professionalizing it all. But, um, but yeah, I think minor league hockey is probably right behind it in terms of its longevity and its, um, uh, you know, pretty uh, spread uh, ubiquity, um, uh, especially in the Northeast and the and the Midwest, and and I mean, we're talking about you know you, we're we're remembering teams here that go back many many decades, and and it we're you know sure. uh, it, it, it you know arguably maybe some industrial league basketball you know uh, uh, components or, or tributaries of the NBA back in the day too, but I you know in ter- if you if you look back in terms of like minor league structure and um just how deep such uh such play has been i mean i think minor league hockey is probably almost right up there with my with uh, minor league baseball yeah you're right the rivers run deep as far as minor league hockey um probably definitely less so than baseball but it does seem to be relatively popular and ubiquitous but uh it's just a it's just a tough go for a lot of a lot of cities in fact the Southern Professional League had a team cease operations mid-season this year because they were getting about, I don't know, like 400 fans a game or something like that. So 
it, it it's somewhat hard to sustain because it is such a costly endeavor to put a minor league team on the ice and then keep them playing and healthy and everybody paid for for a year so um it is ubiquitous though it, it, it does go coast to coast so that's pretty interesting in fact that's what the the ECHL has become now that's a that's a coast to coast league and all, all the way up into Canada as well well, it's interesting. You do call this out. I mean, the, this team, the Cincinnati Mohawks, uh, in the 1950s, were was voted the IHL's greatest team during their 50th anniversary in 1995. Now, of course, the IHL does not exist anymore, no. which is sort of hollow praise, I guess, for something. But, but I mean, it still says something. Hollow, right? pr- yeah, it's it's hollow praise because the league did go away. I think six seasons later after but 50, uh, 50 years is, is nothing to sneeze at, and and to basically it's, add all of that to, yeah. to literally celebrate that is is pretty amazing, and and arguably what took so long for the story to kind of come out, right? Yeah, it is, and if you go through a one of the IHL yearbook record book things, and there's there's nobody even close. There are teams that won multiple championships and things like that, but but nobody who just like stacked them one on top of another in the former fashion that the Mohawks did and did it dominantly. They did it by just thumping the opposition and, and just running away with the league pretty much easily. In fact, there was part of the war of the war, war of words with uh, Toledo was um, Thomas Grace was one of the executives of the garden. He just said, you know, you guys are complaining about this, but it is so ridiculous that we can play in a league where we've beaten the same team 20 consecutive times. That's just a competitive imbalance. Yeah. But to the, uh, to the betterment of the Canadians, right. And, um, you know, yeah. you, you wonder if they could, the Canadians could be uh, dipping into the, that kind of well nowadays when they haven't won anything in forever. Right. So oh, I know it That's... does. It, it does. <laughs> All right. So it is, um, it is a strange cycle. And, you know, you talk about all these teams and everything. And I always will tell people, you know, ain't nothing permanent in these pro sports dynasties, because if that were the case, the Canadians would still be winning. So, well, where, um, where do you where do you go to get your hockey on? I mean, do you go to do you go to uh, Cyclones games? Do you do you travel to see the Blue Jackets? Do you do you kind of not care? I mean, where, where do you where do you get your fix? Are you this is is this more of a an historical kind of uh, uh, interest versus the today's game. Oh no, I love it. I've, uh, this is the first year I've not had season tickets for 20 years. Um, now that I spend a fair amount of my time down in East Tennessee, the closest team down there we have are the Knoxville ice, ice bears in the Southern professional league. Um, but I always go to a lot of cyclones games when I'm here in this area. And then uh, definitely some blue jackets games. We, might go up to Detroit and see a game. I like college hockey as well. I watch a, a fair amount on television still, although I'm not liking the state of the NHL game much these days. It's uh, way too legislated, in my humble opinion. Yeah, well, and maybe some franchises that uh, are still quite curious. I continue to wonder about Arizona, and but I, yeah, I digress. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so- I just don't like the style of play. I, I think it is what, it sort is, of sort of the defensive, like three, two sort of games kind of thing that and everything is, you know, you, you learn certain skills and you learn certain things growing up and coach and how you're coached and the way you play and all of that. And now what used to be a clean, good fundamental hip check is now called tripping. Every time you bump somebody into the boards, it's called boarding or it's called charging a parallel stick is a hook. It's just, there, it's just penalty upon penalty, and I see guys these days pulling off of, of, of good check opportunities. Nobody finishes. Nobody takes anybody into the corner. It's uh, it's just gotten a little bit too much uh, speed and finesse and not much of the physical nature to it, which I always thought made hockey so special is because you had to have both. Yeah, and I think, well, you know, I, when you get to something like an NHL, right, it probably takes some challenger kind of approach, right? I mean, I you look at what Three Ice is trying to do. Uh, that's pretty interesting. I mean, I, I don't know how that's going to grow to a certain level, mm-hmm. but I mean, at least it, it it's a little bit more wide open. There's obviously greater chances for scoring. I mean, I love yep. the fact that there's actually shootouts now, which, you know, took forever yeah. to sort of come about. But um, yeah, I, I would tend to agree. I mean, I, I haven't, you know, hockey was sort of a little sort of lesser in my um, 
uh, in my my sports uh, uh, fandom over over you know my life. But um, mm-hmm. you know, playoff you can't beat the playoff atmosphere for sure. But you know, playoffs are it's only two months of the season, right? What about the other eight, right? So <laughs> right, yeah, for sure about that. Um, All right, so give us some. My problem. team won't. Yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say, I'm afraid my team won't be part of that this year. So my my uh, my end of hockey season in the NHL will be coming up soon. I'm afraid. All right. Well, um, give us some uh, promo for the movie where people will be able to hopefully find it at some point if they're not uh, already privy to it in in the local Cincinnati market. And um, what else you might be doing to promote it and stuff? Uh, have at it. Right. We. Um... Did our world premiere event over the weekend at the Woodward Theater in downtown Cincinnati, and that was a great success and had a really wonderful time with uh, the families and the players who came out who were on the team and had some great memorabilia that we were able to display. So that was that. It is now available on the Vimeo platform, Vimeo On Demand. Just look for the Mohawk Mohawk Monopoly on Vimeo. You can just uh, search that Vimeo On Demand and look for the Mohawk Monopoly. And we're also going to be replenishing our DVDs. Those sold out over the weekend. And you can find a Facebook page for the Mohawk Monopoly. Just search for that. And there will be details and photos and things like that there. And some tributes to players and some good old-time hockey imagery. So... There's that, and then you can find me on Twitter, which is at E Weltner. That's E W E L T N E R, and that's what uh, you can do to to stay in touch with a team that existed seventy some years ago. So the inevitable question, of course, is what's next? You mentioned the Stingers. What do you think? Yeah. Well, I don't know. It's it. It's I've been ruminating, but uh, I, I I'm just getting over this one, just as far as the the time and, and commitment. So I would. I always like to explore the Stingers because we were able to watch them on TV. I grew up in Columbus, like I said. They were on um, one of the whatever cable stations that we got. So I was able to see some Stingers games as a kid. But uh, very intriguing and some really good players who came through. And uh, the, the family that owns the St. Louis Cardinals owned the team back then, the DeWitt family. So it wasn't like they didn't have any financial support. So... Yeah, Stingers would be interesting, so we'll have to see. And I do know the video exists for them. Well, they they've got my vote. I mean, I'm sure sure the swords the swords 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 are interesting. I'm sure they're you know the, some of the other minor league teams are also similarly interesting. But I think the Stingers. I mean, it's interesting when I talk to people who have been in in and around Cincinnati or or and maybe because it's a more quote unquote modern forgotten team, right? But. Mm-hmm. Um, the uniforms, uh, you know, the oh, whole, yeah, one of the best w- logos, yeah. yeah, yeah, how the WHA went down with the uh, with the NHL and Cincinnati not making the mm-hmm. cut and and all that kind of stuff. I, I don't know, it seems to me like that's that would be worthy of your time, but of course, and I know this isn't hockey, but it's pretty darn close. The one year wonder of the Cincinnati kids, I think that too needs its own documentary. Oh, treatment. That, that yeah, may not be up your, that, that may not something. be up your alley, yeah. but it's certainly up mine, yeah. I will explore more. I like the um, untold story. That's that's what I find so interesting is you you find a, a, a story or a situation that you think is underrepresented and then you bring it to life and resuscitate it and let it live again. Yeah. And they um, okay. they uh, they yeah, they had some interesting story. I mean, Pete Rose was part of that uh, ownership group. And I don't WLW did a a promotional a film, which I think is on, on, on YouTube. And I think there's a couple of actual game footage oh, wow. and their, their uniforms were pretty cool as well. They had sort of like these sort of striped, uh, I'll let you YouTube it and you'll, you know, you'll go yeah. down the hole, but look, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. It's hey Tim, you know what, if you want a documentary, why don't you do it for God's sakes. Right. But still you're the, you're the guy <laughs> you're in town. I don't know. Why not? <laughs> yeah. You're busy with your show. So you're always very well prepared and, uh, well spoken. I, I enjoy listening to your your shows as well as being on them. Well, you're you're very kind to say that, uh, and I don't know how much of that is true, but uh, I appreciate the sentiment <laughs> nonetheless. Uh, I do want to leave you with one final question, and and I am I the only? So I have to remind our audience that 
you are the chief cook and bottle washer of this entire thing. You wrote it, you directed it, you produced it, and not unimportantly, narrated it. Have you ever been vocally confused with Liev Schreiber, who does a ton uh, of documentaries on HBO? No, but um, considering I think he's about the best in the business, I would not mind that. There, there are some dulcet the tones. Right. There are some dulcet tones there that sound very similar and to the untrained oh. ear. Um, so Thank I don't you. know. Maybe if he's if he's on strike or or a bit <clears throat> busy, you know, a Ken Burns or some other documentary right. might want to give you a buzz and perhaps a little extra coin for you. Just a thought. Well, thank you for that, Tim. Maybe I can be the poor man's version of Leo Schreiber. That'd be great. So if you're listening out there, HBO Sports, you know where to find me. You heard it here. and I only get 10%, but that's uh, right. <laughs> I would do that happily. Let me know. Do that happily, Tim. All right. Our thanks to Eric. And it is game on if you want to go find and view this great documentary that eric has put together it's called the mohawk monopoly it is available in pay-per-view form on vimeo that's v-i-m-e-o vimeo.com slash on demand slash mohawk monopoly uh we'll have a convenient link to it on our website at goodseatsstillavailable.com and uh, we also encourage you while you're on our website to go uh, back to episode number 181 from uh, September of 2020, uh, our previous conversation with Eric, when we talked about uh, the International Hockey League in Columbus and the various franchises there, the Checkers and the Golden Seals and the Owls. Great conversation there. And that movie from that conversation called International Incidents, which is also available in pay-per-view fashion on Vimeo.com. You can follow Eric uh, on Twitter at E Weltner, E as in Eric, Weltner, W E L T N E R, at E Weltner. Uh, on social media, you'll find us uh, on Twitter at Good Seats Still. Uh, you'll also find us on Facebook and uh, you'll find us also on Instagram at Good Seats Still Available. Uh, again, our website, Good Seats Still Available.com, is the place to check out all of our previous episodes. We post them there. We put some cool images there and, and give you a little recap of the show uh, and convenient links usually to various forms of media. Uh, if you buy a book through our links and stuff, we'll get a couple of shekels of referral love. We'll appreciate that for sure. Uh, and uh, let's see, you could also email us. Why not? We're at hello at good seats, still And uh, our thanks as always to our great friend, Jerry Payne, Jerry Payne, audio excellence. More knob twiddling uh, extraordinariness this week. Uh, and uh, we appreciate that, of course, as well. Next week, fun stuff coming at you. Stay tuned, check your feeds, and we appreciate your listening. Take care until next week. Bye.